Coming up on this episode, we've got a ton of recommendations as we catch you up on what we've been reading and watching recently. Welcome to episode 421 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of queer romance fiction. I'm Jeff, and with me as always is my co-host and husband, it's Will. Hello, Rainbow Romance Reader. It's great to have you here as we continue our super summer bonus episodes. Before we get to a plethora of book recommendations, we want to quickly catch you up on what we've been watching and experiencing recently. Jeff and I had an anniversary at the beginning of the month, and to celebrate, we went out to the theater. The national tour of Pretty Woman, the musical, finished up the last leg of its run here in our hometown of Sacramento. So you obviously don't need me to tell you what Pretty Woman is about. I do want to say that screen-to-stage adaptation is an utter delight, and we had a fantastic time. Yes, we did. And we got to see one of our favorite actors, too. Adam Pascal, who was the original Roger in Rent, was out with the Pretty Woman tour. I thought it was a nice kind of almost a bookend for us in some ways. Our very first trip to New York, way back in 1996, we saw Adam in the original company of Rent, even saw him perform on the Rosie O'Donnell show that we got to attend, and now... As we celebrated our 28th year together, here's Adam on stage in Sacramento for us. I thought it was just kind of a lovely whole anniversary moment for us. <laughs> I think it's so funny that you just mentioned we went to a taping of the Rosie O'Donnell <laughs> show. You realize there's an entire generation of people who have no clue what you're talking about. Well, they missed out because back in the day, she was the queen of Broadway. Oh, goodness gracious. So, in addition to that, we have been watching Eurovision. We are recording this episode a little bit early, so we haven't yet had a chance to watch the grand final. But boy, oh boy, are we having fun. We think it's absolutely amazing. I love it so much. I I just, it's like, I wish we'd been watching it forever, but I'm so glad we have started in, in this year. It's so big, it's so splashy and colorful. And, oh, I think I could watch Hannah Waddingham do anything because <laughs> she has been a delight as a presenter. If you're curious about what all the fuss is about, you can watch Eurovision here in the States on Peacock. In book-related documentaries, Jeff and I watched Judy Bloom Forever, an absolutely terrific movie covering Bloom's life and career and kind of showing us how her life influenced her art, giving us a little behind-the-scenes peek at the creation of some of literature's most important and indelible works. In addition to that, we get a look at Bloom's lifelong commitment to finding book bans, which have plagued Judy Bloom throughout her career and continue even to this day. It was really tremendous to see this loving and insightful documentary about a real trailblazer in young adult literature. It was just tremendous. You can stream Judy Bloom forever pretty much wherever you watch your favorite movies. So in addition to Broadway and singing and books, our interests also include baking, And no mention of what we've been watching recently could fail to cite the Great American Baking Show. This is, of course, the American version, essentially, of the British Bake Off. Last year, as part of a, essentially, holiday episode, some Americans went over to the tent in jolly old England and had a grand time. But now, instead of just a single television special, we get an entire season of American bakers being put through their paces by Paul and Prue. I'll watch baking practically in any form that it happens to come. And this was a great six episodes. The Americans, I think, did us proud in holding up in the tent. Indeed. (laughs) Indubitably. (laughs) Yeah, I think we've gotten very into baking. This particular series of baking is on the Roku channel, where you could also watch the first seven original seasons of Bake Off, along with various other Bake Off related items on a 24-7 channel. It just runs forever and it's just, it is comfort TV anytime you need it. And lastly, in addition to everything that we just mentioned, we, along with seemingly everyone else in the world, streamed Queen Charlotte, which just dropped on Netflix. One of the breakout characters from Shonda Rhimes' beloved Bridgerton series has now gotten her own show. This short six episode series takes us into the life and love of Queen Charlotte, experiencing her life story through two different timelines. First, essentially what is present day, meaning what the characters are experiencing in the Bridgerton timeline, and several decades earlier, 
when Charlotte leaves Germany and comes to England to be Georgia's chosen queen. I absolutely adored these six episodes. I love seeing the love story between Charlotte and George and how much they utterly care for each other with the rest of the chaos that's going on in their lives. I love seeing how the strong women of Bridgerton with the queen and with Lady Danbury and even Violet Bridgerton was formed back in those early years. Such a good story. And it's finally the queering of Bridgerton also as we get a wonderful storyline between Charlotte's footman and George's footman. I've seen a lot of polarizing comments online about how people think that storyline turned out. I have my own thoughts on it, and I am very happy to have seen that. There are some just wonderful scenes in there, and I would like to see Bridgerton try to queer itself more in the future, in the present timeline, if that's possible. Queen Charlotte is, of course, streaming right now on Netflix. And if you're interested in watching anything that we've just mentioned, you can find links, of course, in the show notes. Now, you mentioned just a moment ago that we had a plethora of books to talk about, and we certainly do. And you're going to start us off with some YA books. So I definitely want to take a moment and talk about the latest from Phil Stamper. Now, we had the great pleasure of talking to Phil back in episode 414, and his book Golden Boys was one of my favorite reads of 2022. That book is about a group of four friends who go off and have separate adventures during the summer before their senior year. Kind of a very gay sisterhood of the traveling pants. Well, the adventures of those boys continues in Afterglow. And it focuses on the four friends during their senior year of high school. Everyone returns. Gabriel is beginning to realize having a long-distance relationship isn't everything it's cracked up to be. Plus, he's also investigating why certain queer titles are mysteriously disappearing from the school library. Heath has a minor injury that could have major consequences for his scholarship to Vanderbilt and his future in baseball. Reese is combining his interest in art and fashion and experimenting with a brand new drag persona. And Sal, who, you know, after the summer he spent in D.C., a career on the Hill is definitely out of the question, but politics closer to home just might be where he can make the most difference. As we talked about in the episode where we had Phil on, I caught up to Golden Boys. I saw why you loved it so much, and I really enjoyed getting to come in just a few weeks after I'd read the first book to read the second one. These characters are so amazingly special. Their friendship is incredible and i liked seeing here how each of them grew in some very different ways they're trying to figure out what the next thing is how their friendships evolve how to tell their friends that there are aspects of themselves that they're discovering and they have to figure out how to tell their friends what those are i thought that was particularly true with reese trying to figure out the drag persona and i love sal so much i would love to see sal's continuing adventures as he figures out this political activist kind of life that he's going for. I loved it so much. I'm so glad you got me to read the first book <laughs> because these characters are everything. And I just, I think people will just love these books. And especially now, because I could just do them back to back. It'd be a nice little binge read, I think. So in addition to Golden Boys and Afterglow, which we both recommend you check out, I wanted to quickly talk about another great YA book. This one is called Always the Almost by debut author Edward Underhill. And in this one, trans guy Miles has two goals in the new year. Beat his arch nemesis in the big piano competition and win back Shane, his football player ex. And it's as he's kind of figuring out how exactly he's going to accomplish these things that he meets new guy Eric, who is nice and artistic and cute. So when a, an exclusive Valentine's Day party becomes the in event to attend, Miles and Eric play fake boyfriends to score a couple's only invite. At the party, Miles has an unexpected run-in with Cameron, the aforementioned nemesis, and separately, a slightly awkward but not completely terrible interaction with Shane. The night ends with a kiss from Eric, and what was once fake is now officially real. And it's while exploring the nuances of being a boy with a boyfriend, Miles practices relentlessly with his new tough but insightful Russian piano teacher. The day of the preliminaries arrive, and he does well, making it into the finals in a couple of weeks. It's then that, you know, a series of events leads to the realization that Miles isn't interested in Shane anymore. But a rift with Eric leads to, it's not a breakup, but it's the torturous uncertainty of, you know, some time apart. And that sends ripple effects through his whole friend group. 
So yeah, Miles has got a lot to patch up, all while preparing for the big competition. And it isn't easy, but he does both. And on the day of the finals, he is more confident in himself, in his relationship with Eric, and in his friendships. And he has restored his love of music. I have to tell you, this book is so special. It is kind, it's funny, uh, a little bit angsty because, you know, it's YA. But above all else, it's about joy. In the author's note at the end of the book, Edward Underhill explains that he wanted this book to be a lot of things. A coming-of-age story, because, you know, again, YA. A rom-com, a love letter to classical music, which I thought was kind of fun and different, because, you know, I certainly can't think of many stories set in the world of classical piano competition. But he also specifically says that he wrote this story because I believe firmly that joy can be an act of resistance in challenging times. And trans and queer folks, especially now, deserve all the joy. Which I personally could not possibly agree with more. So if you believe in queer joy as much as I do, I think you should check out Always the Almost. Now to change things up, you've got a couple of books that lean into adventures and road trips. That is true. I've got a couple of great books here. I've been a huge fan of the Fathoms 5 series by Robin Knight ever since I read The Cross of the Sins back in 2008. It's been some five years since The Temple of Time was out, but Professor Fathom's men are back finally in the tears of the Golden Tiger, and I couldn't be more happy to have another action-filled installment of this series and catch up with these amazing characters who were in some of the very first queer fiction and queer romance stories that I ever read. The series is often described as a queer Indiana Jones, and that so fits the bill. In book one, Professor Fathom gathered together five men to help him. You've got Luca, an Italian model and expert in art, both ancient and modern. There's Eden, a Brazilian biologist, physician, and genetic engineer. Then you've got Shane, a Texas cowboy and an expert in cartography. There's Will, a San Diego college student and football star who majors in ancient history. And last but not least, there's treasure hunter Jake. Now, along the way, they've added to the team as the guys found love, maybe needed some more expertise. Now you've got journalist Daniel and street smart Sam, who also happens to be Jake's nephew. This book finds the team fractured as some of the crew previously disappeared and they are still struggling to find a way to get them back. This time out, the professor, Shane, Jake, Sam, and Daniel have to figure out a way to save Eden who was previously abducted and seemingly turned straight. Is there any truth to what the tears of the golden tiger can do? Can they actually erase homosexuality? That's what an evil faction is hoping for as they race the Fathoms team to India to get to the tears. For the Fathoms team, they want to find a way to bring Eden back to them. For the baddies, it's about getting what they need to unleash their so-called cure on the world. As always, Robin writes a thrilling globe-trotting adventure. The team initially splits up to get what they need to get to the Golden Tiger, because of course there's a map missing, and the team never catches a break with the bad guys around every corner. Of course, that just adds to the fun, edge-of-the-seat nature of these books. I love the cinematic way Robin presents these, from exploring a shipwreck, to finding the map, to navigating vines to get to the temple where the Golden Tiger resides, not to mention everything that goes down in the temple because, of course, the bad guys are there right behind them. It is nonstop thrills. There's time for some romance, too. This time it's Sam, who might have found the one with pilot Travis. Their romance is so sweet as they have to move between trying to steal some alone moments, which isn't easy with the task they've got to accomplish, nor is it easy with Uncle Jake being a little overprotective of Sam. We also have glimpses of Shane and Daniel's ongoing romance, which, of course, I just loved. This is a terrific installment in the Fathoms 5 series, bringing me everything I expect between the adventure and the romance. This book, as always, ends with one heck of a cliffhanger, courtesy of a villain that's been a thorn in everyone's side throughout the series. It's all going to come down to The Thief of Thunder, which Robin says is the final book in the series. I can't wait to find out how Robin wraps everything up. If you're already a fan of this series, I don't think you're going to be disappointed with the Tears of the Golden Tiger from Robin Knight. If you've never started this series, now is the perfect time to pick up book one and get ready for the finale. Because I do recommend you read these in order so that you can appreciate the epic adventure that Robin has created. And switching over now to the latest from TJ Klune. It's well documented through episodes of this podcast that I'm a huge fan of TJ's, and that certainly continues to be the case with In the Lives of Puppets. 
which is his latest, and what he terms as the conclusion of his unofficial kindness trilogy that started with The House in the Cerulean Sea and continued with Under the Whispering Door. You'll certainly see the threads of how kindness connects these books together, but where the other two books are really set for the most part inside certain places, this becomes the road trip adventure of the trilogy. At alternate points, this book is very much Swiss Family Robinson, there's some Blade Runner, there's some Terminator, there's a Wizard of Oz feel, and it is also very much rooted in Pinocchio too, which TJ has talked about previously on this podcast back in episode 391, when he was giving us a preview of In the Lives of Puppets when we were talking about the Extraordinaries finale. As always, TJ does such an incredible job with characters, and there's so many vibrant characters here. There's Vic, who's a teenager. He is the only human in this group. He's been living around robots most of his life because he was saved by Gio, who is here standing in for Geppetto. He's kind of been Vic's father for so many years. There's Rambo, who happens to be a Roomba vacuum who is obsessed with musicals. There's Nurse Ratched, which stands for Nurse Registered Automation to Care, Heal, Educate, and Drill. Then there's Hap, which stands for Hysterically Angry Puppet. Vic and Rambo and the nurse come across Hap while they're out scavenging through the junk piles looking for whatever they might need to survive up in the trees where they live. If you've seen the cover of the book, you get an idea of this amazing place where they live, hearkening back to Swiss Family Robinson. But bringing Hap back from the junk area actually triggers off them being hunted down and Unfortunately, a lot of destruction happens and Geo's taken away and they set off to get Geo back, which really leads to an amazing road trip that they end up and go on to the city of electric dreams, which as you might expect is Las Vegas. I'm convinced that all evil things happen in books in Las Vegas because it immediately made me think of Stephen King's The Stand which is where all of the evil people reside while the good people are holed up in Colorado. Anyway, I I totally digress. It also leads to what HAP actually is, because HAP is only a small portion of what his acronym actually stands for. And it really reveals how the world became primarily robot dominated and that there's only a very few humans, Vic being one of them. It's an amazing story of friendship between these characters, which, of course, is something that TJ excels at, bringing together the found family and the power of that found family to bring people back, in particular, like Vic's trajectory here, as he goes from living this isolated life in this canopy of trees to having to go out and see what the rest of the world is like and what has happened to the world that had only been kind of hinted at to him. And Vic also has to grow up a lot, going from just teenager to literally fighting for his life and for his friends' lives. It's really amazing what TJ has managed to put together into this book. It was very much a page turner. I feel like I was more captivated by the characters themselves, almost more than what they were doing, because they were so vividly drawn and I wanted each one of them to succeed. It was just Such an amazing read. And part of the amazing read was because of the narration from Daniel Henning. I totally just inhaled the audiobook. His narration is always outstanding, but in particular, his performance of Hap and of Nurse Ratched was just incredible. I would like to understand from a technical point of view some of what went into creating Hap's voice because he's got a glitchy voice box. And I'm kind of just wondering how Daniel approached that or what technology they might have used in post-production to give him that. It was so incredibly good. And sometimes the glitching also just adds to that performance for Hap. So I was really into the audiobook. So I definitely think you should check out In the Lives of Puppets. And of course, as always, I look forward to seeing what TJ does next. I've also got some terrific contemporary romances to recommend. A Fashionable Deception by Sarah Tieno is a wonderful fake dating romance between Milo of the Del Toro Fashion House and Alex, a model Milo meets during a fashion show. Milo needs a date to his parents' anniversary extravaganza so that he can avoid all the discussions on why he hasn't settled down yet. Alex appears to be the perfect companion. Not only is he handsome, he's also great in the conversation department. These two couldn't be more different, though. Milo was born into a family fashion business, which also happens to have a seedier side that he stays away from. 
Alex holds down multiple jobs, including modeling gigs, in order to take care of himself and his younger sister. Right now, Alex is trying to save enough to let his sister go on a class trip to Europe, and the money from his fake dating Milo will cover that. What Alex doesn't know right away is that he's lost a booking for a show in Paris, which he very much wanted in order to raise his profile in the business. Because Milo wanted to make sure Alex would take the fake dating job. You know that's going to come back and be an issue later. Milo and Alex couldn't be better together. And that becomes apparent to both of them pretty quickly. Milo isn't used to opening up or having people call him out when he's being too privileged. Alex, meanwhile, is drawn to someone like Milo who exudes confidence at every turn. And the more he gets to know Milo, he finds that there are depths to that confidence that make him even more attractive. One of the things I love most about Alex is that he's decided early on that one of his goals for the trip would be getting Milo to smile about something to break the wall of all serious all the time. I love how Sarah takes the compressed timeline, which is basically meeting at the fashion show and then the two days that make up the trip to the parents. Sarah makes it work so well for a little bit of insta-love to take place between Milo and Alex. Every conversation they have about how they grew up, their current lives, and ultimately what they want just draw them closer and closer together. Each of them find qualities they like in the other and qualities that they like to be around. Oh, and by the way, the sex is great too. Let me tell you, Sarah writes sexy, steamy moments between these two that you just know are going to get hotter as they get to know each other better and better. This was a perfect bite-sized romance and everything I would want out of a novella-sized read. I loved getting to know these characters as they got to know each other. I also liked how they navigated through the tough discussion on Alex losing that Paris job because of Milo. So if you're a fan of the fake dating trope, I hope you'll consider adding a fashionable deception to your reading list. After loving a fashionable deception so much, I was eager to read a full novel from Sarah. And she did not disappoint with The Best Man's Problem, which is book two in the Navarro series that's part of Harlequin Presents. This enemies to lovers, opposites attract story, set in the lead up to a wedding, was absolutely wonderful. Rafael and Navarro shared a kiss years ago with Etienne Galos. It was a moment of recklessness Rafi would love to forget about because Etienne had ghosted him ever since. It's hard to forget, though, when Etienne is on hand for all the wedding events, and even more inescapable when they end up working on the bachelor party together. Rafi only agrees to this because he would do anything for his sister, and he wants Val and Philip's wedding to be perfect. Rafi and Etienne are so fun on the page. It starts out with a lot of friction. They don't seem compatible at all. Rafi's detail-oriented, very into schedules, and wants everything just so. It makes up a perfect party planner. Etienne is more of a fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants kind of guy. He'll likely be late wherever he's going. He won't pack for a trip until the last minute. Actually, planning something isn't really in his wheelhouse. That becomes clear when Rafi brings out a spreadsheet to help with the planning, and it just, that moment alone, causes so much tension. Unfortunately, these two aren't great at talking either, and maybe sorting through that baggage that sits between them. Why was Rafi ghosted? Instead, they plug away at the party planning. It all goes in fits and starts, but they do make progress, and they do find a way to get along, and even get a party planned that's a big hit. Now, I absolutely love how Sierra brought these two together. The sparks between them as they argue party planning methods are so honestly cute, and it shows the glimmers of how good they could be together. For both of them, the desire grows, even as they wonder how they could possibly be a couple as opposite as they are. Rafi is scared to love and open his heart. Etienne also has trepidation about opening up. The reasons for this run deep, and when it's finally all revealed, it was a big emotional weight lifted for both of them. And frankly, for me too, as the reader. Sierra rolls this out in such a great way. I wanted to see these two succeed, and they did. It wasn't easy to get there because of the things that happened to both of them in their past. But yes, it was a fantastic payoff. And when these two come together, man, did the sparks fly. They are so smoking hot once they get past their hangups. And they've got great people in their corner too. In particular, I loved Rafi's family. They support him. They make him feel heard. But they also give him a kick in the pants to get him to take the leap. Just exactly like you want a good family to do. I'm really glad I've discovered Sierra's books, and I look forward to seeing her next queer romance. In the meantime, I recommend The Best Man's Problem for a great Enemies to Lovers read. I mentioned earlier how well documented my love of TJ Klune is. 
Another fandom that has been chronicled many times in this podcast is my love of Serena Bowen's hockey romances, and her latest, The New Guy, fits right in there with the others that I adore so much. The story of Hudson and Gavin is swoony good. The things that I like about this book start with the meat cute itself. Hudson and Gavin are both new guys. Hudson is new to the Brooklyn Bruisers hockey team, but he's stuck at home while the team plays in Boston because he's hurt. Gavin is a new athletic trainer for the Bruisers. These two meet at a bar watching the Brooklyn-Boston game. Neither knows they're about to be colleagues. They watch the game. They flirt a little. They play some ping pong. They decide to leave together. But guess what? (laughs) They're also neighbors. That makes Hudson call off the hookup. You see, he's not out to anyone in Brooklyn, or really to anyone outside of some close family and friends. Of course, the angst level around that amps up once they show up to work the next day. I do love a good workplace romance, and this one has it all. (laughs) They can't really get away from each other at work, since Gavin, of course, has to help Hudson rehab. They can't get away at home, since they live across the hall from each other. (laughs) It is such a brilliant setup. None of this keeps them from feeling the attraction grow from that initial inkling in the bar. Hudson sees a great guy in Gavin, and even a family, too, since Gavin has the cutest daughter. Meanwhile, Gavin is feeling attraction for the first time since his husband passed away. Both guys have a lot of concerns about what a relationship could mean, even in the best of circumstances. But here, there's a lot stacked against them. But, as they spend more time together, including some super cute time with seven-year-old Jordan, it gets harder for them to deny what could be. I was so swept up in these guys' cuteness that this was a real page turner for me because I just didn't want to leave their story. Now, besides the workplace stuff and Gavin sorting out what it means to find love again, they both have some monstrous people on their lives, and I don't use that word lightly. Gavin's in-laws are pretty terrible as they put pressure on Gavin to have Jordan spend the summer with them, and they even threaten to take custody away from him. He's not sure what to do. He wants the best for Jordan, but it's a lot being a single dad, even when he's got some help from a very supportive sister. Meanwhile, Hudson's father, who also serves as his agent, is terrible. He's not really allowing his son to come out, and in many ways not even looking out for Hudson's career, but he's more wrapped up in what he wants Hudson to be and how that aligns to his own legacy. I'm happy to say that I loved how Serena wrapped up the plots with the parents and how eventually Gavin and Hudson were able to get their HEA. It was hard going there for a while, and I'm just reading the book, as you've heard me talk about a few times before. It's like, how are they ever going to solve all of this? But Serena did it in her usual fantastic style. So for a wonderful workplace romance with some great internal and external angst to be worked out, I don't think you can go wrong with The New Guy by Serena Bowen. All right. Now, I think I'm going to wrap us up with some great shorts and novellas that I've read. I recently enjoyed the short Never Have I Ever Gone Skinny Dipping by Riley Hart. And the cover of this one is illustrated. It's gorgeous. So that drew me in immediately. And plus, it's got Riley Hart's name on it. So I'm, of course, going to read it. This one is about shy, nice guy Mickey. And he is a librarian by day and erotic romance author by night. And if what I just said doesn't make you automatically want to read this, then you are obviously listening to the wrong show. Now, Mickey has a favorite coffee shop to work in, owned by the irresistible Ronan, who also has a sex positivity podcast that Mickey is a big fan of. Now, over the course of the story, in his own time, Mickey steps out of his comfort zone, first flirting with Ronan, getting to know him, and dating, and having some super hot sexy times, and yes, eventually skinny dipping. In Mickey and Ronan's case, it was always meant to be. It just took them a little longer than usual to realize it. Oh, this super sweet short has got lots of banter and so much heart. And if you have a few spare moments in your day, I really hope you'll pick up Never Have I Ever Gone Skinny Dipping. Not too long ago, I read two amazing novellas, the first of which was Pick One by May Archer. In this one, after a breakup, Tegan needs help moving into his new sublease. And when Big Brawny John shows up, they go over to Tegan's old place, where John helps put that jerk face X in his place. They bring Tegan's prized tufted sofa back, and it's then that he realizes that John isn't his brother's best friend sent to help him with the move. John is actually his brand new roommate. A year later, they are still roommates and the bestest of best friends. 
but everyone around them knows what they are not yet ready to admit, that they are absolutely in love and totally meant for one another. One afternoon when Tegan texts that he has some big news to share with John when he gets home, it sets off a chain of events, uh, an absurd and wacky cascade of rom-com misunderstandings that leaves them to finally face what they really want, each other. And that night they are able to admit their true feelings, and uh, after releasing a year's worth of pent-up sexual tension, they get down to the business of planning the rest of their lives together. Oh, guys, it is so schmoopy and perfect! Pick One is a pitch-perfect, friends-to-lovers rom-com novella that, while it's loosely connected to May Archer's other series, it can totally be read and appreciated all by itself. I also recently read The Tinker's Apprentice by Jordan Castile Price. And in this one, Conrad, who works at a magical repair shop, is having problems deciding what directions he, you know, he wants his life to take. Across the street from Conrad is the Auxiliar Shop, a kind of pet store with magical companions. Now, in this story world, auxiliars can take any form from cute kitty or puppy or weird little gargoyle. But Rune has decided on a human form, a form that Conrad has definitely noticed from his shop window across the way. In a spontaneous moment of decisiveness, being decisive is not Conrad's strong suit. But he finally decides to ask Rune out, and they really click, having a great dinner together and an even greater time afterwards. Wink, wink, if you get what I mean. The next day, Conrad is compelled to finally choose an auxiliar. He goes to the store and picks up a weird greenish-gray blob. Someone in the story describes it as potato-like. And when he gets it home, it transforms into Rune. You see, the blob thingy is his true ancient form, kind of like a trilobite. Those little petrified seashell thingamajiggers. Anyway, Rune may not know much about the modern world, but he's been around long enough and is pretty much expert at fixing anything magicanical. Conrad and Rune can now live happily ever after and together they can tackle whatever magical challenges come their way. So this short description, it like barely even scratches the surface of all of the wonderful stuff Jordan Castillo Price jams into this really funny, super quirky romance. Now, and admittedly, I haven't read as much Jordan Castillo Price as everybody else, but I do know that there is absolutely nobody else who can combine the sweet with the absurd for their very own specific blend of cozy paranormal fantasy romance. It's completely unique and utterly charming, and I think you'll all enjoy The Tinker's Apprentice as much as I did. This episode's transcript has been brought to you by our community on Patreon. If you'd like to read our recommendations for yourself, check out the show notes page for this episode at BigGayFictionPodcast.com. We've also got links to everything that we talked about in this episode. And as a quick reminder, if we didn't give you enough book recommendations here, you can also get book recommendations in your inbox every Friday. You can sign up for the Rainbow Romance Reader Report, this podcast's official newsletter. We feature new releases and coming soon books to keep your TBR up to date. You can sign up over at BigGayFictionPodcast.com slash report. All right, I think that'll do it for now. Coming up next Monday, Ari Baran is going to join us and talk about their debut romance, Game Misconduct. I love this book so, 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 so. Just infinite so's attached to that much. I have no doubt it's going to be on my favorite list for this year. You're not going to want to miss my conversation with Ari about this incredible enemies to lovers hockey romance. Thank you so much for listening, and we hope that you'll join us again soon for more discussions about the kinds of stories we all love the big gay fiction kind. Until then, keep turning those pages and keep reading. Big Gay Fiction Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more shows you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Original theme music by Daryl Banner. <laughs>